Okay, it's uh, quarter after by my watch, so I think we'll go ahead and get the show on the road. Uh, so thanks everybody for coming. Uh, my name is Mark Velker. I'm the OpenStack architect at VMware. Um, and we've got a great customer panel here uh, to tell you a little bit about what these folks are doing and what problems they're solving with OpenStack. Um, so let's take a minute and just let you guys introduce yourselves. Uh, hello, my name's uh, Peter Bogdanovich. I'm the uh, manager for uh, compute and virtualization services for Nike's uh, Consumer Digital Technology Group. I'm Tim Gelter. I'm on the compute platform team of Adobe's digital marketing tech ops organization. Uh, and I'm Prashant Rao. I'm with Wells Fargo. Uh, so I manage the engineering group responsible for deploying um, OpenStack within Wells Fargo. Great. Thanks. So let's start off with a little bit of background. Um, obviously, you guys are all looking at different business problems. We've got a couple different industries represented here. Um, so why did you choose OpenStack? What was the kind of business problem that you are trying to solve, and how did OpenStack help you get there? So for us, um, we didn't start out trying to like build a, a private cloud necessarily, or even we didn't say, hey, we want OpenStack. We started out with just trying to um, change the relationship we have with managed service providers. So we, we get a lot of services from managed service providers. We, we got very slow um, responses from, from them for um, infrastructure changes, and we wanted to sort of change that relationship. So we, we basically just wanted to manage our own uh, vCenter and, and our own uh, vSphere infrastructure, and then, we, and then as we sort of worked with the DevOps teams, they wanted APIs. And as we looked at the ways that we could deliver um, the APIs to them, um, we sort of landed on OpenStack as the, as the one that was most obvious. So some, something of a similar story for us. We, um, throughout the years, have had a ton of acquisitions, uh, different companies, and they, they'll have one or more products within uh, their organization, each with their own way of doing things, right? You've got different operating systems, different uh, network technologies in use, et cetera. And uh, so we looked, first of all, at a way of standardizing a lot of that. There's a lot of inefficiencies when everyone's doing their own thing and not sharing between each other and that sort of thing. And then, you know, frankly, time to market was very important. We wanted a, a way of uh, allowing people to allocate resources uh, in a non uh, ticket as a service model, right? We want to give them API access. We want it to be a, a stable open API that we can count on for the next, you know, at least dozen years, uh, as opposed to something that might go away. Sure. Um, yeah, we had, uh, over the past 10 years, we had virtualized a large part of our infrastructure using VMware, VMware. And a couple of years ago, about three years ago, we developed like a homegrown web app, which has just allowed self-service access. And it was just a .NET based web application that was, we called dev as a service. And then about a year and a half or two years ago, there was a, a real decision made at the executive level to say, OK, we want to build out a enterprise-grade private cloud. And so the decision point at that point was, OK, let's bring in OpenStack. And so that's really what kind of drove us from a kind of proof of concept model um, of self-service offering via web UI to a full-fledged OpenStack-based private cloud environment. Gotcha. OK, so that's actually kind of a good segue um, into talking about kind of the, the workloads that are running on top of this. Um, obviously, in the OpenStack space, we see a whole lot of different kind of workloads. Some are kind of platform two, some are more platform three. There's pets, there's cattle. Um, can you kind of give us an idea of, of the kinds of applications that you guys are running on top of this? Yeah, so for, for us, um, this stuff that's in the data center is sort of the legacy um, apps. This is we and one of the one of the requirements that we had sort of going into this is that is that when when we sort of took more control over vCenter and we and uh, over the vSphere uh, infrastructure is that we we didn't want to require any application changes. We didn't want to require anything of the of the application engineering teams, and so um, so these are much more like pets, unfortunately. But we're trying to 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 sort of treat it more like cattle, or or at least bring some automation to the deployment of these things, um, in the hopes er, in, in to sort of work towards making these things sort of shorter lived and and not so long you know um, long lived. But it was hard when when it was a, like a managed service sort of everything was via a ticket. There was a lot of resistance to ever giving up a VM because it took so long to get one. Created so, we're, this is sort of a, bar, a part of the uh, like progression. Um, but but we also but we also had to sort of like live with these apps that have a lot of um, that, that sort of expect to live in an enterprise data center um, sort of environment and and provide that kind of um, experience. 
Gotcha, gotcha. And so in your case, the consumers for OpenStack are actually your internal app teams, both new and old. Yeah, and really my consumer for, for Open, OpenStack is really just sort of the release management group because they own the, the sort of path to prod, all the various like environments that, 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 um, that the application packages like, are deployed to as, it, as they move to prod. Gotcha. So we have we have vastly different groups. You know, we're kind of on both ends of the spectrum, right? We've got the uh, the 15 year old SaaS application that was you know born in bare metal, very manual processes, expecting you know we buy the you know most expensive hardware, expecting it'll be up for five plus years, right? And then you've got the other end with these new acquisitions that started in Amazon that expect you know uh, redundancy in the application as opposed to the infrastructure, and so we're we're trying to accommodate both of those uh, workloads, right? And then you got the the others that are saying, hey, look, you know, we kind of see the the point of the cloud. So we're going to try to move towards that model, but we're just not ready, right? We, we still need to have the infrastructure be there in case something goes wrong, but we want to be able to spin up resources quickly. So in your case, you've kind of got the full spectrum. Absolutely. You've got some really old stuff, some really new stuff. And yeah, you want to say it. platform two, 2.5, 3, we've got it all. Sure. Okay. Yeah, we're much more similar to, to Peter, um, <laughs> and we have a lot of um, legacy applications that are treated as pets. Um, and um, you know, we have to ensure that we can provide a platform that supports those. And also, because we have, to in, we have a highly regulated environment, so we have to ensure uh, an integration with asset management system, uh, operational readiness, uh, compliances, et cetera. So in that regard, we are, our workloads are primarily uh, legacy applications. Uh, and enabling them to take advantage of the cloud is really almost secondary because really there's a lot of changes that just need to take place in order to get those app teams to onboard onto our cloud and there's a whole process that we go through of onboarding do they meet the criteria did they need uh, load balancing requirements can we satisfy those what kind of tier classification is that application is it a critical application therefore it's probably not a candidate for our cloud right now um, and like Peter also mentioned, I mean, our end users or our customers are primarily what we call build and release teams. So these are essentially release engineering teams that um, are act as proxies or surrogates for the application development teams themselves. And so they're the users of our cloud primarily um, using currently the Horizon interface, but eventually we're hoping that it'll migrate to uh, API-driven usage. Yeah, that's, so that's a good segue as well. When we look at the, the sort of spectrum of OpenStack users out there, we see a lot of different consumption models as well. There's some people, like you say, that are, that are kind of using Horizon. They're doing the point and click thing. There's some people that are using the APIs directly. Uh, some people are using Heat. Um, so it sounds like, um, you know, in your case, a lot of folks still, still kind of in the earlier phases where the numbers are a little bit smaller that they're working with at any time. Uh, Peter, I know you and I have talked a little bit about uh, some of the, the larger scale stuff that you guys are doing. Uh, so the consumption model is probably a little yeah. different for you. So we've only had this sort of, we had this in our lab of like about six weeks ago. Now it's, we've sort of deployed it in sort of this new uh, vSphere environment that we, we built out. Um, and we've only had it in there for about a couple weeks now. And, and just, just maybe 10 days ago, I sort of like let the, the DevOps team sort of add it. And, then, and, <laughs> and uh, you know, they're immediately sort of experimenting with sort of scale and things like that. So we, we are using Heat, and they're also using a library called Fog, mm -hmm. which is a, you know, a, a Ruby library. Um, and so all of, all, we're, we're, we're trying to do everything um, through either heat or fog. Like there'll be no, we, we really are discouraging anybody using the, the GUI for anything or even the command line tools for anything. One of the principles that we want to have is sort of everything should be checked in. Like any change that we make to the, to the infrastructure anywhere should be, um, should be documented in code and should be, um, uh, and should be checked into a, a source code management. It's, it's a very DevOpsy consumption. We're, we're trying, we're trying to push that all the way down to like the floor of the data center. That, that, um, that sort of design pattern. Gotcha. OK. And how about you? So, so again, with the full spectrum model, right? Like, we definitely have teams that launching an instance at a, at a time is absolutely all they need, right? They just want to get a VM, so they do it, and, and off they go to the races. And then we've also got, again, the other side where it's like, OK, Heat is fantastic as a starting point. We want to you know, start there, and, and API is important as well. But we also want to move that outside of um, OpenStack specifically, in a way. Uh, we have a, a homegrown CMDB system that's pretty powerful. And ultimately, we want all of our configuration for our infrastructure to, to come out of there, right? So you would you'd define your cluster, you'd define your application inside of the CMDB, then it then is going to go into uh, OpenStack via API using heat templates or maybe not, right? We'll, we'll see how sure. that works and, and define what that looks like. 
uh, in a way that we can deploy you know, to our private cloud, to the public cloud, whatever we want to do. Cool. So OpenStack's got this like really big ecosystem. Um, there's lots of different pools of abstraction. There's different networking backends. There's different storage backends, different hypervisor backends. Um, you guys obviously all made some, some choices that are fairly similar. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, what kind of got you excited about where you are today in terms of how do you go about selecting vendors or different backend technologies that you've been working with? And I think we've got a couple different use cases here. So Peter, let's start with you. Yeah, OK. So for us, it, wa it was mostly sort of around sort of comfort and, and sort of um, experience with VMware. Like, particularly my management has a, has a long history working with, with VMware, much more even, much more so than me, and, and had very strong feelings that that was like the, the most important uh, choice was to choose a, you know, um, a really reliable hypervisor platform. So that choice was sort of made before we even got started with anything. Um, and, then, and then it was sort of a, a, where we struggled more in trying to figure out what we were going to do was trying to figure out like what we were going to do for orchestration. And so we looked at a lot of different sort of orchestration tools. So um, you know, we built a very like you know the idea that we we build out um, sort of a tried and true uh, vSphere architecture was sort of that was sort of a done deal, and the, the, the questions were sort of like okay, well you know let's let's work with like Cisco and VMware, and, um, and we chose NetApp instead of EMC, but whatever, uh, you know like these these big enterprise um, tools, very well understood ar architectures, and then the the where we really struggled was with the automation layer, and we looked at a number of different things. Uh, the DevOps guys basically hated all of them and, um, until we got to uh, OpenStack. And now they're, they're suspicious, but, they're, but they don't hate it. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Tim, how about you? So, so for us, um, you know, believe it or not, virtualization is actually a very new thing within our organization. Uh, two years ago, you could have counted the number of virtual instances on you know, two hands, basically. So we've gone from that to about, I don't know what the latest count, 13,000 VMs, I think, in the last couple of years. So that, that was a big sell in and of itself, right? So um, these other technologies are, are, are scary for our teams, right? We're very siloed. We've got a, a storage team. We've got a networking team. We've got a security team, et cetera. They're all very much in their own domain uh, protecting their kingdom, right? So if you start talking about software-defined storage, software-defined networking, et cetera, they, you know, they, they hesitate a lot, right? So, uh, we had the experience with VMware. We were able to show business value, so we were able to also say, hey, look, we have technologies from VMware that we can trust to, to get started so that you can uh, get a taste, stop being afraid of it, and then you know, start to come along with us on the journey. Okay. And Prashant? Yeah, uh, to a certain extent, I mean, for, uh, the choice of a hypervisor was really not a choice in the sense that, and it, that was, that's a good thing because obviously with the introduction of OpenStack and a cloud, that's enough of a process and cultural change that um, de-risking that choice of a hypervisor was a smart thing. So for us, we had already been working with VMware for a number of years and virtualized a large part of our infrastructure. We have a lot of the uh, VMware administrators all well-trained, et cetera. So it was, you know, we kind of left that aside. And then we actually made a distinction between um, uh, infrastructure deployment and then application provisioning. And so with application provisioning, essentially, um, or excuse me, infrastructure provisioning, application deployment. And for the higher layers of the stack at the app layer, um, you know, we went through a process of looking at uh, various software configuration management tools, Puppet, Chef, et cetera, and, and selecting one of those. So we've made that distinction, and, and that has allowed us essentially to offer an infrastructure platform layer for provisioning infrastructure, and then at the application deployment layer, allowing a little bit more flexibility and choice, whether we use like Heat, and heat templates or Puppet or other aspects for app deployment. Gotcha, OK. So it sounds like a couple of you um, kind of mentioned a couple of common themes. You were talking about how it was kind of an easier on-ramp to OpenStack, which in itself was kind of a scary technology at first, but um, kind of met the needs that you were looking for. Um, and you also kind of mentioned the ability to operate over time. I think, Prashant, you mentioned you know, having IT staff that were already pretty well trained in that technology, so it was familiar ground for them. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, about operations. Um, so day two is obviously the thing that everybody's more concerned with in the OpenStack space now. A lot of the day one problems have, have kind of been solved. Um, and now we talk about how do we operate it over time? How do we deal with all the log messages that all these distributed systems create? How do we keep it up and running? Um, and how do we know when things are going wrong? Um, so can you give us an idea about you know, what, what kind of things you're looking at in that space? So yeah. Um, <laughs> So that's going to be really challenging for us because we've relied so much on our managed service providers. Part of what we're doing is by bringing more responsibility on ourselves is that we have to now provide, we also have to provide these services. We have, or these operational roles have to be filled. 
And so that is something that is, uh, there's a lot of work going into that right now. And there's, there's sort of teams working on sort of building out our sort of monitoring capabilities and our, and our sort of incident response capabilities. And so that's sort of yet to be seen how I, I, I'm working with them. I want them to be very successful. I don't want my phone to ring all the time. Um, but it, I'm a little bit, you know, that's something that still has to be sort of proven in our organization. Um, as a part of our installation, though, we installed VR ops. So we, we, when we purchased the vCenter things, we, we purchased the vCloud suite um, licenses. So we installed VR ops and we installed the login site tools. And so we have that wired in, and we have that wired into sort of our manager of managers kind of, um, uh, you know, a, a alarm panel, basically. So we have that sort of basic guts of that wired in, the thresholds, the tuning, the, you know, the sort of run books um, are still sort of in development. So with us, I mean, uh, one of the fortunate things with, with VMware in particular is that it seems like, you know, over, over time, it's been a very operations-focused organization for a long time, which is where we're at, right? We, we work with the developers and, and so forth, but, but that's what we care about most. And so, you know, we already know going into it, you guys have thought about these things. Um, we've got ways for upgrading, which in a lot of cases, you talk about upgrading an open stack, and it's, a, you know, a can of worms you don't, you don't want to open, right? Um, when you talk about uh, just just the ability to roll back, right? If there were some sure. some issue, right? That, again, that's not something that's easily done. Um, and then you know the monitoring as well. So so we have dedicated monitoring teams, and we're still working with them on how that would work. But you know the things we've been able to do with Log Insight have been pretty uh, pretty incredible. That are just out of the box, right? You you install the thing and you're good to go. So I, I think a lot of it we're we're able to view operations as kind of a boxed offering from VMware, uh, whereas we we need a much bigger development team to cook those things up on our own. Cool. Sure. Yeah, I mean, obviously, in addition to using some of the uh, VMware-based tools and VCOPs and things like that to look at the VMware infrastructure in particular, we also use, um, we, we found a great experience using just Nagios, obviously, and in integrating with our existing uh, network, man network management systems, uh, you know, and, and working with our NOC for that. Um, and then in addition, we also, for log aggregation, we use ELK. Uh, the Elasticsearch and, and Logstash Kibana stack. Um, and that's also been another really great offering. So I think you know, the combination of the kind of the existing tools out of the box with VMware, um, and then some of these, the newer tools that are specific to the OpenStack environment, that's how we're kind of bringing it together. And it's still, there's a learning curve in those new tools for sure, uh, because they're not vendor supported, they're open source tools. And so there's a lot of, um, you know, it, it, it's allowing us to kind of get the best of both worlds. So. Okay, so you're, you're kind of getting the best of kind of the open ecosystem as well as the products that you already know. Absolutely. Gotcha. Okay. So in terms of operations, um, you know, we talked about a couple different size clouds here, a couple different styles of deployments here. How big actually are the ops teams that are running these clouds? Are they fairly big, fairly small? Uh, I'd say pretty small. I think that there's like five of us that are, um, that are, that are building this. And then we're going to plug into an organization that's bigger. You know, that, that's, that's, they support the stores, they support, the, you know, there, there's, there's a sort of bigger organization out there that we will then sort of plug this into. It, um, and then, then you're dealing with much larger teams that will be, you know, dozens or, I don't know, they might even be bigger than that. Because there, there's a whole sort of um, uh, support organization out there that sort of reports to different management. I sort of work for more for the engineering side. Gotcha. So very, very similarly, um, the idea of using OpenStack was born within the cloud team, but you know we've got these organizations. I mentioned that you know the kind of like the siloed uh, teams that we've got. We're working with those guys. They're coming along, and you know fortunately we've been able to get a lot of buy-in. So you know we've got people here at the conference from our storage team looking into you know Ceph and Swift and these sorts of technologies. We've got. Uh, network engineer here who's the architect looking into you know what do we do around networking from a physical perspective and we've got a security guy here talking about you know how do we secure this thing and so uh, ultimately yeah I mean our, our team's small we've got you know three people working on this actively but we've got uh, again you know dozens uh, within our grasp to to grasp onto this thing once we're looking at more of the day two operations gotcha. Yeah, and for us, I mean, our, um, the operations team that supports OpenStack is about a dozen people so far, and that's primarily to support the OpenStack infrastructure. But the actual instances that created, obviously, there's the whole broader uh, operations team and uh, support team, tier one, tier two, et cetera, that, that supports that whole side of it. So um, from right now, I think we're, we're actually doing OK with the current staff that we have for supporting mm -hmm. our operations, or for our uh, OpenStack infrastructure, per se. Um, but you know, it's going to continue to spike as we grow. Sure. Certainly. 
So it sounds like pretty small teams for the most part today that are that are plugging into a larger uh, uh, organization as things scale up. Yeah. Cool. Um, so you mentioned networking and security, which are kind of two hot topics in the open stack space. We saw those come up in the keynotes earlier in the in the week here. Um, so let's talk a little about about those. Um, in in the networking space, obviously, there's a lot of a lot of different choices to be made in how you architect the networks to go into these uh, uh, clouds. Uh, and a lot of it kind of is driven by what your workloads are intended to be, and we've got a couple of different workloads here. So um, give us a little overview of what you're doing on the networking side. So, so we didn't want to require changes of, of the developers, and we didn't even really want to require a lot of changes in the configuration management. So there were tools that, that were being used already, you know, F5 load balancers, um, uh, firewall, like physical firewalls between data, like physical database servers and app tiers, things like that, that, that we weren't going to require people to, to make changes. We wanted to basically be able to deploy these, these apps sort of unchanged into this environment. So as we looked at that and we looked at our choices there, um, we decided to, to use provider networks. So we basically built a regular sort of like data center with the same tools, with F5 load balancers in them, with you know uh, a, a sort of east-west firewall in there, and then um, and then uh, use provider networks and sort of map VLANs in, and sort of kept tried to uh, keep relatively large flat networks that we deployed lots of VMs into. Um, and I haven't had it, it's it's sprawled, so now there's probably a couple dozen VMs that I have to keep track of. But um, <laughs> but but it's it's I tried to like uh, you know we I very consciously tried to like sort of say well you know we're gonna do like slash twenty ones or something like that or slash twenties we're gonna make it really big and flat and so that was sort of our um, uh, you know our choice that, that we made this this time around. So in Adobe's case, you guys have a lot of acquisitions, a lot of different teams that are working within the cloud. So maybe a little different networking model. It is. Um, so and also the other the other piece to that is the physicals, right? We can't ignore sure. those. We've got. You know, more than 75% of our infrastructure is physical, and we have to interact with those systems, right? So uh, we're, we're very much in the midst of making a lot of those decisions. There are some things that we've come to terms with, like, you know, if we try to extend the, what we're doing in the OpenStack world to the physicals, we're not ready, right? We're, we're not going to be able to do that. And so we're taking more of a greenfield approach. We're saying, look, we're going we're gonna, to, in certain data centers, we're going to roll this thing out. And we have to decide, does it need to communicate with the other instances? If so, what does it do? Does it go over the WAN? Does it go direct uh, connect? You know, what are we going to do there? And it seems like what you know, we're kind, coming to consensus about is that we're going to be doing, uh, working with the network engineering team to get a very solid underlay network. And then we're going to transport over VXLAN and uh, you know, hope to do translations to VLANs. And, and you know, we're still cooking it up, right? So this isn't, this isn't production today. Um, but it's going to be a complicated problem. Yeah, when we made the decision about a year and a half ago um, to go with OpenStack for our <laughs> private cloud in the enterprise, we actually decided to go with Nova Network still at that point. So we've actually uh, have stuck with that, and, and it's basically just using Nova Network with Flat DHCP Manager. And in one case, we actually uh, do have a, a need for um, supporting VLAN Manager within Nova Network. Um, we're in the process of upgrading or you know making a decision to um, go with uh, Neutron uh, and uh, NSX. Etc. Um, and, and so that's going to be happening in, in, in this year sometime. Um, so as such, you know, there's obviously can, that may require a forklift upgrade. We're still exploring options. Um, but with regard to things like load balancer, etc., we still have a pretty big team, um, a load balancer team within the company, and we're leveraging that, you know, so those capabilities outside. So we don't necessarily, we're not, we're we're still taking the crawl rock walk, run kind of approach to things in the cloud and, and um, really just getting adoption onto our cloud and moving them from just virtualized infrastructure into onto an OpenStack administered virtualization infrastructure. So, you know, you've been around the OpenStack community for a while now. In some cases, some of you are relatively new to the OpenStack community. Um, give us a feel for, for what does the OpenStack community need to do next to make customers like you more successful? What are the big gaps that we have left to close? Yeah, I, I'm not even sure we even really understand sort of like where where the problems are. Like our, our first problems that we've, we've ex experienced or the things that were sort of missing for us is sort of around sort of like sort of understand the API scale and and um, just being able to, you know, we're having a hard time sort of, um, you know, we're just so sort of new to it that we're having sort of a hard time sort of understanding kind of like where the edges are and, you know, um, where you know where things, how far we can push things. Um, so I think that that 
the sort of the maturity, uh, and, and this isn't maybe so much about OpenStack, but maybe around the, the, the VMware's integrated OpenStack, um, is sort of understanding um, sort of where the limits are there or, or best practices for design there. I think that that's still sort of an evolving thing and that we're going to be a part of uh, those decisions. Um, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I'm not sure I have a whole lot more than that, though. <laughs> So uh, I'll answer in a couple of different ways. One from the uh, the VMware side of things, and then community in general. So you know, I've got we've got Dan over here. We give him a hard time all the time. You know, it's a fantastic product. <laughs> um, one of the things we've been drilling is, you know, we want our developers to not really know or care that VMware is behind it, right? So if if they find something online, a heat template or something that they want to try out, we need that to just work without any caveats of oh. This doesn't work because you know the image has to be stored in Glance in OVA format or you know that sort of stuff, right? And so masking a lot of that so that developers just they, they don't care what's in the back end. We can tweak it as we need to is is a big thing for us uh, from the VMware side and then from the community side in general. It seems like um, and this you know not to hurt any feelings or anything, but over our over the last months that we've been working with it, it seems like in a lot of ways the the community tries to do. Uh, Everything Amazon's doing, try to be everything to everyone, taking on too much without t spending enough time, you know, stabilizing, getting rid of bugs, working on the performance so that we make sure we can scale to the to the extent that we need to, and and uh, along with that, there's a lot of confusion about, you know, what what can I use today versus what is, you know, just incubation. Don't really want to touch it yet, uh, so we don't really know where to make our bets. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, if you look at the, the keynote this morning, I mean, there's a lot of talk on Docker. And if you go to some of the sessions here, the Docker and Container and Cloud Foundry sessions are just completely jam-packed. And I, I was kind of reflecting on that and thinking, well, if we look at the whole pets versus cattle, I mean, pets are here to stay. And it's very unsexy, and it's not really interesting to work on. But one of the things that I would challenge the OpenStack community would be to continue to offer support within the platform to uh, extend support for pets because they're here to stay and that's one of the reasons I'm with VMware it's a great choice for us because it allows you know you have that stable platform that has all those underlying capabilities um, and I think that's something that's lost I mean when we have Docker and, and Mesos and you know all these kind of cool technologies going on there's all the stuff that kind of runs the day-to-day -day business of very large enterprises like Wells Fargo that um, we need to continue to support and we need to provide capabilities within OpenStack if we're going to get the adoption from those companies. Cool, thanks. Okay, I think we've got time for maybe one or two questions from the audience. Um, there's a microphone here in the middle if folks can make their way there. Or just raise your hand and shout. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, right now our cloud is, uh, is internal. The, our consumers are internal facing. Um, so it's all internal business applications. So it's not the external facing transactional, financial transactional applications currently. Okay. But that can change in the future. Uh, question, did your security group get involved in this? And how did they react? Oh, yeah, I think that was to me. Uh, so, so yeah, absolutely. They've been engaged since day one. We've had to have um, a number of security reviews in order to bring in any new products. I mean, with VMware, of course, we, that was de-risked because that was well entrenched. But to bring in OpenStack and any of the ancillary, tech, ancillary technologies, they were embedded with us day one. We have to get their sign off. And there's a security review process that all new products have to go through that it went, it did. The rest of you guys, the security well, teams, yeah, pretty involved. We work closely with the security teams as well, um, and and they they met with us regularly. They're actually very excited about NSX. I mean, NSX is a big selling point for them, and and so um, as we sort of like become more mature and start to use the security groups better, because there there, my boss even before we we thought about using uh, OpenStack was really hot for NSX. Like everybody was like, oh, we're gonna get it anyway. And but then like from our perspective, it's sort of like, well, how would we manage deploying things? We have to figure out how to like in some orchestration tool, we have to reach into vCenter and we also have to reach into the NSX manager. It's gonna be really kind of complicated. This actually s simplifies a lot of those problems, but I, I there's a there's um, a lot of enthusiasm from our security group around NSX. Yeah, so to kind of add to that thought, we had a similar experience. We had our, our security team, first of all, when we went to them with this idea, they said, oh, well, we're going to do a cloud. This is, you know, this is intense. And then we started talking about some of the things they could accomplish. NSX in particular came up as very interesting for, uh, for the policy application, as well as 
Uh, surprisingly, images. We, uh, up to this point, don't do anything with images. Everything's a bare metal or, or you know, uh, an installation onto a VM, the, the operating system laying down the configuration, users, and so forth. So they see that as an opportunity of saying, hey, look, we can actually standardize this thing. And we can run it through uh, a pipeline before it goes to production to check it for compliance and so forth. And so they, they see a lot of wins there as well. Cool. So in some cases, it sounds like OpenStack's actually giving you better security than you might have otherwise uh, had. That's the hope, yeah. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Other questions? I can, I can go first yeah, if go you want some more time to think. Um, <laughs> so, so I think I already kind of uh, showed my hand a little earlier when I talked about the, uh, the challenges that we've had working with uh, internal teams. Uh, a lot of time it hasn't been a technology problem as much as it's been a problem with uh, sharing the vision, getting people to, uh, to work with us and not against us. And you know, fortunately, that's changing. So I think uh, you know, making a, a, an effort at a, at a high level to um, Tackle this as a group would be a, a good thing to change for us. Yeah, and I think that, well, t we sort of went at this backwards. We sort of said, well, you know, we want vSphere. And then it was like, well, how are we going to run it? Oh, well, then we need automation software. I think that, you know, w we basically just were completely upside down. We should have said, what do our customers want? Um, they want these APIs to do provision infrastructure. How are we going to provide that? And, you know, I, that that is uh, that's sort of a mistake that that is sort of my fault, but sort of like kind of driven from above too. And so I think that if had we had we had more time, and um, there, there's just it's a very aggressive team that that on the in the CDT part of Nike, and so there was a, there was a lot of pressure to just sort of just go do it, just get something done. So slowing down would have been good. I like that. Just do it. <laughs> 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 yeah, and, and I think, you know, if I had to do it over again, I would have uh, probably relaxed our controls that we had for access into our environment. So we had a pretty rigid onboarding process. And so um, that perhaps stifled a little bit of the adoption. And so I probably would have changed some of those policies and then said, let's, you know, really make this more of a elongated POC to begin with. Yeah, uh, right now, not for us. I mean, it, it's really, um, you know, pets types of applications or P2 type applications uh, on, on our environment. Um, and so they're highly vetted even before they get onto our platform. So if they need, let's say, you know, some type of, you know, I don't know, an Oracle database and, you know, it's in a different data center, you know, then that's just not even a candidate application. So they're pretty highly vet vetted before they even get onto our platform. From our perspective, we, um, I mentioned the, the hardware footprint. So we've been managing that sort of spillover with, hard, with spare hardware uh, in the past that's just always online and ready to go. So those, uh, those types of uh, applications we're well aware of, and we're, we're looking uh, at them specifically to give us feedback. But I think I, I mentioned before, you know, we're still in POC. We're, we're working with them to say, how well does this actually work? We're starting to, to work with uh, you know, Dan and team on how do we do auto scaling so that the, you know, the admins don't even have to think about it, right? So that you know, Solometer triggers something, and instances get spun up and added into the infrastructure. And you know, those, are, those are all roadmap at this point, uh, no, no real experience to speak to there. Within Nike, there's teams that, that are building apps that, are, that we consider cloud native apps. And so the things that are cloud native and they're, they're deploying to public clouds have these things sort of built into them and designed into them. We're dealing more with sort of legacy things. Uh, we believe that there's opportunities um, for, that, for responding to uh, workload um, in this, but it's sort of a level of maturity thing. So this is something that we, we sort of have like these code names for this. We're, we're calling this one like um, like there was uh, the old stuff we called Coke Classic. This is Coke MX, and uh, is is the code name for what we're doing right now. And then you know the idea that we'd be able to um, you know respond to workloads and stuff like that is sort of more as we try to um, containerize things and, and move things in that direction. So that's sort of like a 2016, and I think we're just sort of calling it Rainbow right now because it's like <laughs> over the rainbow. <laughs> okay, in the back.
So from my perspective, uh, a lot of it's just unfamiliarity. Um, the, you have a, a lot of people who have been doing the same thing and doing it quite well for a long time. Anything new is going to be uh, questioned, right? And that's, that's not a bad thing, right? You, you absolutely should be doing that. So I think just, just selling the idea that, hey, look, maybe there are some efficiencies to be gained here um, has been the best way of going about it and, and trying to solve some of their problems with the tools. I mentioned you know, with security, for example, we were able to show some value there. And we've been able to do the same with uh, some of the other teams as well. Yeah, for us, it's, uh, it's somewhat cultural, but also because uh, we've already virtualized a large number of our server infrastructure, you know, the question they ask themselves, the app teams ask themselves is why? And um, so we've had to use sometimes, you know, the care, sometimes the stick. Um, and, you know, eventually we're trying to get them to the point where, you know, you get onto our platform, then you can actually engage in application transformation and, you know, make it cloud aware and take advantage of our APIs, et cetera. But right now it's just, you know, trying to get them on board. We're not really seeing a lot of uh, resistance. People are very en enthusiastic about being able to have control over their infrastructure. The idea, of, you know, they're used to working in a open a ticket and wait somewhere between 24 hours and a week to have something happen for them. The idea that they can immediately like make changes and, and, and work, get it work done that day is um, incredibly attractive. Um, there, there is a little more, um, there's a, we're having a little harder time with the folks that the Windows, uh, sort of the legacy Windows apps, we sort of you know, invited them to sort of you know, put their development stuff into our, into our cloud, but they, they so far have not taken us up on that. Other questions? How do you handle data proliferation if you move towards containers? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> We're not moving there yet, so I. <laughs> That's why it's over the rainbow, right? It's yeah, over it's the rainbow. Over. We're not there yet. This is we're not. There's no Docker container model in, in anything that we're doing. We are, we are, we have our own deployment, um, homegrown deployment application deployment tooling. Um, that's like 10 years, it's very mature, it's been around for years, um, and it has this sort of key value substitution um, database kind of thing that it does, um, and it has its own package format, and all we need to do at the infrastructure layer is get a VM uh, image built that has sort of enough smarts in it to like get Puppet running that deploys this, these deployment tools, and then you can deploy apps there. So we also see that as a big problem. Um, it, it, containers, data proliferation, uh, you know, sprawl, and so forth. And you know, it, it's something that's uh, becoming more and more apparent as we start to actually plan these apps. Right? We've had discussions with developers, and we've gone over like you know all these different tools they want to use. You know, they want to have physical machines with RAID. They want to have uh, Mesos running on top of that. They want to have multiple uh, copies of data in, in HDFS. And you know, it, it's a problem, right? And so we're we're hoping that uh, the, the community comes in and helps us out with that, because I don't think from an operations standpoint we're ready for it quite yet. Um, maybe that's just us, but that's kind of how we see it. Yeah, and, and yeah, we haven't embarked yet on the container and our strategy for that yet at all. It's too early. How are you guys handling security policy inside your private cloud architecture? It's an easy example from CI. So, we sort of we separate everything out in in vSphere, in, in vSphere and we have completely separate um, uh, tenants and and, te and separate networking. So it's completely kind of isolated. I'm not sure that we're going to put the the PCI. It's sort of this is sort of an idea. We sort of built the clusters for PCI and we sort of built the tenants for it and stuff like that. But I'm not sure that we're going to deploy there. We sort of talked to the security guys about it. They given us the okay to do this. Um, but, but right now it's all in the dev space and we just kind of fake the, uh, the PCI stuff in the, dev, in the dev space. So we create the, the, the same sort of interfaces for it. So you have to kind of go through and authenticate through a different tenant and stuff like that if you want to deploy things into the PCI area. But, um, but it all lands on the same clusters in, in vCenter, at least in the dev space. There's, 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 and we've sort of modeled how it would work in the prod environment, but we haven't bu actually built it out yet, or, or even we're not we're not really sure. Okay, I think we're just about out of time, so lightning round, real quick. Any other answers? No. Okay. All right. So I think we're about out of time. Thanks everybody for coming. Um, we've got a couple of case studies, so come see Trevor if you want to uh, take home one of those. <laughs>